I, Joan Smith, do solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Ms Smith, I'll say to you, as I've said before, thank you very much indeed for uh, agreeing to give evidence. Uh, this was a voluntary activity and I'm conscious that uh, it exposes personal matters that affect you in the public domain, which is one of the things you're concerned about. So I'm very grateful to you. Thank, Thank you. Good morning, Ms Smith. Good morning. Can I ask you, first of all, to state your full name? Please? Joan Alison Smith. Thank you very much. Now, you've provided a witness statement uh, to this inquiry, and we can see that, um, I think, on the big screen. Um, but before I ask you any detailed questions about your statement, please, can I ask you to confirm that the contents of your witness statement are true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. Those of us who have the witness statement in front of them, uh, we're going to be looking at paragraphs four to seven. But for those who don't have the statement, could you tell us a little about who you are and some brief details of your career history? Um, I've been a journalist for more than 30 years. Um, I started my career in national newspapers on the Sunday Times. I worked for the Sunday Times Insight team doing investigative journalism, um, doing stories like the Iranian embassy siege, um, uh, the Yorkshire Ripper murders and so on. Um, after that, I decided to go freelance and um, I've written for a lot of national newspapers, The Guardian, the Independ both The Independents, um, mainly as a columnist, uh, The Evening Standard too, and I also write books. I'm the author of six novels, published novels, and I also write um, feminist books and... Um, my most famous book is about woman hating called Misogynies, and uh, I also wrote for Penguin a book about secular morality. And, and then I do my human rights work um, for, uh, from 2000 to 2004. I chaired the English Pen Writers and Prison Committee, um, which was set up to promote freedom of expression around the world and to look after imprisoned writers and their families. So, at any one time, we were looking after about 50 um, writers, academics, poets, and so on in places like Syria, China, um, trying to make representations on their behalf. Um, latterly, we started um, sending people to observe them, their trials if they were in court. I, in 2005, um, I went and observed the trial of Orhan, pa Orhan Pamuk in Istanbul um, when he was on trial for insulting Turkish identity. And then latterly, um, in 2008, I got involved in a literacy project in Sierra Leone, um, collecting um, books in this country. I did that with the Times. Um, they, they gave me the space to, um, to launch an appeal for children's books when I came back from Freetown. And we were able to collect about a quarter of a million, 300,000 children's books, which we shipped out to Sierra Leone to set up school libraries um, in uh, between 1,500 and 2,500 books in, in different schools. So I do, I do both those things. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, can I ask you about one specific part of your career history, please? The one that you deal with for everyone who's got the statement, paragraph, the end of paragraph 11 of your statement, the Human Rights Policy Department of the Foreign Office campaign for free, for campaigning for freedom of expression for journalists around the world. Can you tell us very briefly about that, that work? Um, Robin Cook was a friend of mine, and um, in 2001, just before the election, he asked me if I would chair his last big speech as Foreign Secretary. Well, we didn't notice his last big speech, obviously. Um, and uh, afterwards, that, uh, he, he wanted to talk about um, how he had put into action the ethical dimension of his foreign policy, which had been a very famous statement that he'd made after he became Foreign Secretary in 1997. And at a lunch afterwards, um, I met both his um, special advisor, Michael Williams, and the head of the Human Rights Policy Department. And they said to me, We'd like, we want more involvement with NGOs. Um, and Penn, obviously, is, is, has NGO status. And um, they suggested that um, if I was uh, thinking of sending someone to observe a trial um, in somewhere like Belarus, which is actually quite a frightening thing to, to do, um, to, to go to court somewhere like that, that we could liaise with the Foreign Office and, and they would put us in touch with ambassadors and high commissioners. And we set up actually quite an effective system so that 
Um, if somebody was, I mean, I remember there was a trial in Belarus in particular. I asked um, someone from the committee, from the Penn Committee, to go and observe the trial, and they got a lot of help from the British ambassador in, in Minsk, which was very fortunate because actually there was a very unpleasant scene and the court was cleared by the local version of the KGB. So, um, so and, and we also did things like... Um, there are bipartite talks every year on um, the future of um, Turkey's application for the, uh, to join e the EU. And we did a lot of monitoring of human rights in, in Turkey. And we would take part in those talks at the Foreign Office each year and give lists of things like um, all the books that had been banned in Turkey in the last year and whether it was going up or down and whether journalists were still being imprisoned and so on. I see. Obviously, a lot of interesting work there and freedom of expression issues. Um, how important, can you tell us briefly, how important do you consider freedom of expression for journalists to be? Oh, I think it's absolutely essential. I mean, the reason I got involved in this work, this voluntary work, is that it seems to me that a free press is absolutely a cornerstone, a sine qua non, of civil society. Um, if you don't have a free press which is able to call um, politicians and um, big companies and corporations, multinational corporations, all sorts of people to account, then I think you have real problems. So I've always felt that I was very lucky to be able to pursue a journalistic career in a country where we did have a free press, um, because I'm very aware of what happens to journalists in countries where there isn't one. Can I ask you this? Do you consider yourself to be a celebrity? <laughs> not, not, not in the least. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a very minor public figure in the sense that I write books and um, increasingly people who write books are expected to turn up at literary festivals and talk about where we get our, our, our ideas from and things like that. But um, I'm a writer. Um, I, I can speak in public, and I, and I have. But um, I don't think that I'm somebody whose private life would be of much interest to the reading public. I mean, I'm sure that... Um, apart from the papers I write for and people who maybe like my novels, most um, newspaper readers would be quite baffled to know who I was. I don't really want to ask you about any aspect of your personal life, save one. Um, you say at paragraph 8 of your statement that for a number of years you were in a relationship with um, Dennis McShane, who's the MP for Rotherham, mm -hmm. former Minister for Europe. Is that correct? Yes. Um, can I ask you this? It's probably an indelicate question, but was there anything illegitimate or secretive about that relationship? Well, Dennis and I, were, he was my partner from um, 2003 to 2010, and um, I was always quite open about it. I mean, um, just before this, um, the, the, I first appear in Mr Mulcair's notes, we had been to um, a conference in Venice that Dennis was speaking at in early 2004, and I remember that we had dinner with the former prime ministers of Italy and Sweden, and that doesn't seem to me a very secretive way to conduct a relationship. Can you tell me whether you ever have discussed your personal or private life in your columns? And if so, what sort of thing you would typically say? Very rarely. I mean, I, I remember once um, Dennis um, rang me and said that he and three friends um, had just got to the summit of Mont Blanc and, um, that morning, and he was very excited about it. And I was writing, a, as it happened, a column for The Independent that day, and um, I was talking about, um, you know, the changes... The, the way in which ageing has changed. And now people um, of my generation do things at ages that our parents would never have dreamed of. And I just mentioned that. Um, but it was just a sort of, you know, half sentence about uh, my partner rang to say he'd, he'd climb Mont Blanc with three friends who were all in their late 50s. That was all. When did you first become aware that you might have been, that your voicemails might have been accessed in that way? In April this year when I got a, an email from a detective at Operation Wheating. Can you just tell us a bit about what happened and what you did? Um, I arranged to... Um, I, I, I got in touch with the, the detective um, and uh, wrote back to his email and said, I gather you're trying to get in touch with me and here are all my details, including my home address, my home telephone number and my mobile phone. And he emailed straight back and said, oh, right, th those are all the details that we've got in Mr Mulcair's notebook. Um, so he, he invited me to a meeting and um, I went to uh, my lawyer, Bindman, um, uh, Tamsin Allen organised a meeting and two detectives came and I sat next to one of them and Tamsin sat across the table with another detective and there's a kind of ceremonial unveiling of the notes and um, you're asked, um, and I'm sure lots of other people have gone through this now, um, you're asked, can you, uh, we're going to show you some pages, photocopy from Mr Marquez's notebook and can you tell us if you, um, 
if you uh, recognise anything. And of course, you know, the very first page is my name, address, all my phone numbers and so on. And as the pages go by, um, Mr Mulcair made a note of the fact that I was writing for both The Independent and The Times. And um, what seemed very significant to me and what I found profoundly shocking was that he... He, he seems to have been a very obsessive note-taker, and as well as writing the name in the corner of the person at the News of the World he was dealing with, he also made a note of, of dates. And my name and address and, and details appear in Mr Marquez's notes for the first time on the 5th, 5th of May 2004. And that's approximately six weeks after Dennis's eldest daughter was killed in um, a skydiving accident in Australia, which had attracted a huge amount of publicity. And um, I was incredibly shocked that in that period when um, Dennis was uh, bereaved. Um, and as you, as you can imagine, it's not an easy time for anybody when a 24-year-old girl has just died in such circumstances, um, that uh, the news of the world had been interested enough in both of us to ask Mr Mulcair to listen to our voicemails. So can you tell us um, what your reaction was when you saw this notebook and you found out in all likelihood you had, had your voicemails accessed at this time? I'm, I'm amazed by how shocked I was because I've, uh, in my in my journalistic life, um, I've had one or two bad experiences. You know, I, I I was caught in a riot in in Sierra Leone last year, which was pretty unpleasant. And I do now recognise the impact of shock. And on that occasion, I didn't because I I was just in a daze. I saw all these notes, and Mr. Mulcair had had obviously found out that he made a note that we were going to Spain. I was going to a pen conference um, to meet um, other, um, other people, other writers who work for freedom of expression. I was going to Barcelona and Dennis was actually coming out at the following weekend and he was going to make a speech in Spain and we were arranging to meet up. And I was amazed by the detail of notes that Mr. Valquer had made about flight times and um, uh, uh, and a note saying her to him, so he, he, it appeared that he'd been getting information from my voicemail. And the, the, police, the police said to me, um, is there any way that Mr Mulcair could have got this information legitimately? Um, and given that it was um, about two months after the Atocha bombings in Madrid, when there was a very high level of security around government ministers, it did seem unlikely that he... So, so anyway, yes, to answer your question, I... I I remember leaving that meeting, and I had to go to a meeting in the city, and um, I would, you know, my mind was just buzzing. And, I, and again, you know, as the Dowlers were saying, you suddenly start thinking, oh, did that happen? Does this explain something? And I arrived at um, uh, my meeting, and I was slightly early, and went up to the boardroom, and the managing director, secretary, came in and said, are you all right? You look completely white, and got me a cup of tea. And I realised afterwards it was just shock, complete shock. I had no idea that was happening. Can I ask you something else about that period? You, what sorts of things were you writing? You said that you were writing columns uh, during that period. What sorts of things were you writing about? Um, well, I was writing a lot for The Times, um, and I was... Um, uh, I was writing columns for The Times, and they would ask me to do additional things, like um, Vivian Westwood was having a huge retrospective of her work at the V&A, and they asked me to go and do a f cover feature. So I interviewed Vivian Westwood, and um, you know that my name was on the cover of T2. Um, I was also writing columns, and um, I think it was on the 8th of April 2004. I think we've got that document. Oh, yes. We have that document in front of you. I think yes. it was handed out this morning to everyone in this room. <coughs> Yes. I, I wrote a column, um, this column headed Celebrities or Pagan Deities. Um, I think there'd been a huge amount of um, interest in the marriage of um, the Beckhams at that point. And they had been doing what celebrities often do, which is try to kind of um, negotiate their way through you know, a, a personal crisis while also not alienating the media. And so I wrote a column saying... And I suppose what was in the back of my mind was that the intrusive reporting of the death of Dennis's daughter a month before. I wrote a column um, saying that um, I think that people make unwise decisions. They think that celebrities think that they can kind of control the media, you know, that they can keep them friendly. And actually, the appetite for stories and personal life is so remorseless that they lose control of the story. And so I was, I was saying in this piece that I found it very disturbing that we've gone from a situation where 
you know, the idea of privacy used to be a shield for hypocrisy. And so people used to do terrible things in their private lives and pretend that they were upstanding, fine Christian gentlemen and so on. We've moved from that, which was not a great thing, to a situation where people have almost no privacy at all. And so I, and I was saying in this column in The Times that um, I found it incredibly shocking that no matter what happens to people, whether it's a bereavement or a marital problem, you're, you're apparently expected to deal with this completely in the public eye and be open with the media. Um, and I, I wrote this column in The Times, and four weeks later, the News of the World asked Mr Mulcair to spy on me. Well, what's the link in your mind? Um, if any. I'm not sure there is one. I think, I, I, I think that from what I've been able to understand about Mr Mulcair's activities and the number of names in his notebooks, I think it, was, it, well, it has been said that the, 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 the spying was on an industrial scale. And I think almost anybody, um, this could happen to almost anybody, that's the astonishing thing, that um, you, know, you don't have to be um, an incredibly famous actor or actress, or um, you don't even, you, know, you just have to be tangentially you know, come into the orbit of somebody who's well known. And I think probably that um, there, is such a, there is such a gap between the cultures of the two parts of the press, the, the, the kind of what I think of as the sort of serious press that I write for, and the values of the tabloid press, insofar as they have any, that it wouldn't even occur to them to look at what probably what I was writing and actually think about the arguments. You've now had a few months to digest the information that you may have had your voicemails illegally accessed in this way. How do you feel about that now? You've told us a bit about how you felt about having your phone accessed at a time when Mr McShane had lost his daughter. Have you had time to reflect? How do you feel about it now? I do think there is a sort of wider um, lesson to be drawn from it, um, which, which I think I mentioned this at one of um, Lord Justice Leveson's seminars, that it seems to me that tabloid culture is so remorseless, its appetite is so um, unable to be filled, that the people involved have lost any sense that they're dealing with human beings. And when, when I was doing investigative journalism, I quite often had to go and knock on the door of somebody who was bereaved. Um, but it wasn't because I wanted to know how it felt. Um, it was because I was writing about, you know, say, the, the Yorkshire Ripper murders. I interviewed the three of the women who'd been attacked by him and survived. And there was always a sort of purpose which I could explain and say, you know, you may not want to talk to me. If you don't want to talk to me, I'll go away. Actually, nobody ever did say go away. But um, I think this is very different. This is just... Um, everything has become a story. And we're all caricatures. I've said this in my writing, you know, that, um, you know, we're, we're all... I, th I think to, to the tabloid press, we are just, we're just two-dimensional. Um, we're, we're just fodder for stories. Can I ask you to turn to paragraph 25 of your statement on with, where you deal with press conduct generally, more generally? You explain that a number of articles have been written about you over the years, including as recently as December last year. Um, these articles tended to be, we've seen from, from them, about your relationship with Mr McShane. And you say that as recently as December 2010, they wrote an article about that relationship, despite, despite the fact that it had ended mm. um, some months earlier, as I understand it. Um, what's your view? Are such articles appropriate? I think it, it depends entirely on, on the context. And it seems to me that... There is a difference between somebody who's in the public eye, like a politician, say, who makes, you know, what I would call traditional family values a part of his political or her, her political platform. If somebody is saying, you know, the, the sanctity of marriage is very important and um, people should, shouldn't have, um, you know, cohabitational relationships or anything like that, um, and, and they then kind of pose with their family in their election literature and so on, then... I think may, maybe that's a different situation, but the point is that neither Dennis nor I ever kind of courted um, the press and invited them into our lives, and quite the opposite. And each of the, the occasions, and this has gone on, f you know, on, at a low level for about 20 years, I've had phone calls and, you know, been um, approached by journalists, and they, they always come in this chummy kind of way and say, oh, you know, can you tell us about, you know, your relationship with so-and-so? And I always say to them, I'm a journalist. You know, if I wanted to put my private life in the public domain, I could do it myself and I'd get the facts right. Um, so, you know, why would I need you as an intermediary? Because I always try to be um, fairly polite. Um, but, um, and, and I also think, you know, in, in December when I, when I got this call, it was only a few months after I had left Dennis. And um, 
I, I, I don't think that the, the journalists who, who contact you realise that or care that you're in quite a vulnerable state, you know, that you're still processing all the feelings of a long relationship ending. And it's actually not very nice. I was in my gym. I actually had just been running and I just removed all my clothes. My phone rang and I got this person from the mail saying, um, you know, we, oh, Joan, you know, we gather you, want, you and Dennis are no longer an item. And I actually thought, what a wonderful metaphor this is. You know, I'm naked before the tabloid press. And why should I be? Well... Can I ask you this? Um, some people might say that the press are entitled to write about the personal relationships of public figures, regardless of, such as MPs or ministers, regardless of whether they, they make statements about the virtues of family life and so on and so forth. What would you say to that? I think it's the confusion of um, the old confusion of, the, of not understanding the difference between what interests the public and what's in the public interest. Um, and I think that private life has become a commodity. Um, and there are lots and lots of... I mean, I, I wrote a whole book about secular ethics and morality, and I think there are adults le lead their lives in lots of different ways now. For example, I think that, um, I think that uh, uh, the, the um, legalisation of civil partnerships for gay and lesbian people is a, is a great advance. And I also think that marriage should be available to them. So I think adults lead their, their, their lives in, a, in quite a sophisticated way now, and they don't use one model. And yet the tabloid press seems to sort of live in a kind of 1950s world where everyone's supposed to get married, stay married, and if, you know, if anything happens outside that, then it's a story. Can I ask you about the two articles that you refer to in your statement? The first is a, a statement, uh, an article from the Mail on Sunday from the 19th of June 2005. This is a, an article which you should have in your exhibits. Um, and the headline, Blair's secretly divorced Mr Europe and the feminist who believes marriage is redundant. And the other article is one from... Well, let's just deal with, first of all, with that yeah. one. And that's obviously the one that was written uh, confirming that your relationship was happening. Um, Blair's secretly divorced Mr Europe. Was Mr McShane secretly divorced? Well, I didn't know you could be secretly divorced. I mean, I thought that um, you, you... I mean, uh, I thought you had to go to court and that it was listed and so on. Um, and uh, I, 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 think there, I think there is a quite interesting confusion there between secret and private. Um, I think Dennis probably, I don't want to speak for him, but I think he probably regarded his divorce as a private matter and um, didn't go around buttonholing journalists and saying, oh, did you know I just got divorced? Um, but I, I can't see how it was secret. The other article is, is the article you just mentioned, we don't need to turn up, the, main, the one where you were contacted whilst you were in the gym and asked about your relationship, which had by then ended. Can I ask you this question? Did you complain about either of those articles at the time? No, it never even crossed my mind. Why, why did it not cross your mind? Oh, because um, I, I, I've seen too many um, versions of press regulation in this country, the Press Council and then the current PCC, um, and I don't think that um, they are adequate bodies to, to deal with this kind of problem. And by the time... By the time you complain to them, the article's out there anyway, and all your friends have read it, so um, you know, you're not going to get much in, in the way of, of redress. I have been asked to put um, one other question to you, and it's about an, an article you wrote um, in, the, in, in the Evening Standard sorry, on the 5th of December 2001. Mm -hmm. I hope there's a copy in front of you, and I yeah. think it's been handed out this morning to those who are present here. Um, this appears to be, I'll paraphrase it, um, an article that you wrote in 2001 about um, Elizabeth Hurley and her relationship uh, with a gentleman called Steve Bing. Uh, I'm not going to paraphrase the entire thing, but you obviously discuss um, the issue that was uh, occurring between the two parties at that time and uh, set out at the end some views. I've been asked to ask you this. You wrote about Elizabeth Hurley and Steve Bing. You wrote about their private life. If, uh, as you say, the tabloids have become overzealous about reporting on people's private lives, why do you yourself write articles about this, these celebrities? Um, <coughs> because I've been writing um, since the 1990s about um, the, the, the 
the mistake, I think, that celebrities make of putting too much of their private life in the public domain. And, of course, I didn't go and doorstep them. I didn't ring them up. I didn't ask them about their private life. They had put that in the public domain. And if you read the article, what, I, what I'm saying in it is that this is a very dangerous thing to do. I mean, I've, I've said the same thing about the late Princess Diana. And it goes back to something I was saying earlier, that people think that they can put their private life in the public domain and, co and, and still control what's said about them. And... What worries me is that, given the underlying misogyny of the tabloids, that somebody like, at the time, Elizabeth Hurley was pregnant, and I thought that she was, she was in a very vulnerable state, and there's such a kind of underlying misogyny in the media that I thought it was actually quite a dangerous track that she was on. And, and if you look, you will see that I talk about um, the, the kind of underlying unease <coughs> that, that there is in our culture of women who are, who are beautiful and who... who base their careers on their appearance and, um, and, and the danger that they lose their reputation, to use an old-fashioned word. And so I'm, I'm, I'm always incredibly happy when I get a chance to smuggle um, feminist ideas into the popular press. Thank you very much indeed. Well, um, a few final questions. You've explained in your statement that you've got considerable experience um, fighting for press freedom across the world. You've told us about that. So in the light of your experience, um, can I ask you this? You don't deal with it in your statement, but I want um, to know whether you have any views on the current system of regulation. Does it work? And do you have any views on what you would like to propose? Or no, I don't, think, I, I don't think it does work. I mean, I'm very opposed to any idea of state regulation, and I'm completely opposed to the idea of licensing of journalists. I think... Broadly, there are two things that need to happen. One is about regulation, the other is about culture. In terms of regulation, I think that the, there needs to be a kind of successor body to the PCC which um, isn't, isn't dominated by editors, uh, which has more representation from outside. Um, I think that uh, there ought to be things like... I, I think it ought to be... If, 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 um, if newspapers don't, don't take part in it, then I think they should lose their VAT exemption. So there should be um, a sort of carrot and a stick for them um, take, taking part. There ought to be a much faster right of reply. Um, I think it should also take in um, mediation in other situations like you know, where, the, where libel might be involved and so on. I think it needs to be a much more complex and, um, and capable body. But on top of that, I, th I think what needs to happen is a change in culture. Um, and I think that we do have a tabloid culture which um, I think is, al is almost infantile in its attitude to sex and private life. My, my impression is that tabloid hacks go around um, like children who've just discovered the astonishing information that their parents had sex and they can't resist peeking around the door in the hope that they might see it. And the rest of us actually get on, you know, and, and live our lives. And I think that obsession with sex and private life has become remorseless and pitiless in terms of what it does to, to not just celebrities and crime victims, but just ordinary people. Well, thank you very much. Is there anything that you would like to add? I don't have any more questions. I don't think so. I've got a couple. Mm -hmm. um, you've identified, uh, on a number of occasions, the ethics of what you've called the tabloid press. But is there, or should there be, any difference to the ethical considerations which are put into the work of reporters by any section of the media? No, I don't think there should, and I think that's a real problem. Um, when, I, when I first started out as a journalist, um, I wasn't particularly aware of any codes of ethics, but I knew why I'd become a journalist. Um, I mean, in, you know, in a kind of young, um, idealistic way, I wanted to change the world. Um, and I thought that there were at times, you know, it, it might be necessary to break the law. I mean, during the Yorkshire Ripper investigation, I was threatened with an official Secrets Act prosecution, which didn't actually happen. Um, but I think the two things have diverged much too far, and it should be possible to have, you know, a vibrant tabloid press, which does the kind of things that, you know, say that the Daily Mirror did a few, a few decades ago when, when the tabloids saw themselves as crusading papers. But I think that is not something they see themselves as doing particularly anymore. And so... There is a separation which I think is very damaging. A lot of the time, you know, pe people like me who write for the, you know, what I was talking about earlier is the serious or the broadsheet press. Um, it fe I feel like a different breed from the, from the, 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 the ethics, the, the people who, who work on tabloid papers. 
OK, and the second question is this. You've seen the material that the police um, assembled from the Mulcair notebooks. Do you have any sense of whether uh, you were being targeted because of you or because you were an adjunct to Mr McShane? I think the latter. I, I, my kind of guess is that his daughter's death made his profile much, much higher, and so um, they got interested in him. And once they got interested in him, they got interested in me. So I, I suppose I was kind of collateral damage. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed.